Yesterday, former President Donald Trump was charged in New York with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records ahead of the 2016 presidential election, making him the first president ever to be charged with a crime. To unpack what this means and what to expect in the future, I'm joined by Jeffrey Bellin of William & Mary Law School. Jeffrey, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on. We've heard the terms indictment and arraignment quite a bit over the past few days, weeks, months. But for people who aren't as familiar with the justice system, what exactly do those terms mean? Sure. Well, they're they're distinct. The indictment is a formal charge, so a formal accusation by the government that someone's committed a criminal offense. And the indictment is handed down by a grand jury. So a group of citizens who are called to service have voted uh, on the indictment. And that is a document that has now been made public that shows the actual charges that have been formally uh, alleged against Donald Trump. And then the arraignment just follows the indictment in this instance, where now that uh, Trump has been formally charged, he's brought before the courts and that proceeding is called the arraignment. And that's kind of the first appearance. What do we know about Trump's legal response to all of this? In this case, there's a lot of publicity and we kind of saw it coming for a while. So there have been some suggestions of uh, what he's he's going to say. Uh, One thing that I thought was interesting was the suggestion that the trial can't be fair uh, in Manhattan. And so one of the motions I'll be looking for is does the Trump legal team try to move the trial somewhere else um, that uh, he thinks a jury uh, pool might be more uh, open to his arguments or something like that. Now, those are very rarely granted, but this is a very unusual case. And so that's the kind of motion that that, uh, Trump could make to try to move the trial somewhere else. Uh, And then the other things that we're likely to see are legal challenges to the theory that the district attorney is using to elevate this offense from a misdemeanor to a felony. Are there systems in place to prevent politics from interfering with the legal process? Yeah, great question. I haven't seen people uh, talk about that enough. Uh, Yes, is the answer. One thing that uh, is agreed is that you would not bring a case for political reasons. Now, it's certainly possible and prosecutors sometimes break the rules and do things that are wrong, but it's important to know that that would be a huge transgression against the prosecutorial ethics code and prosecutorial norms to bring a case for political reasons. And then the other piece institutionally here is that the grand jury is is supposed to function to check prosecutors who are doing things that are wrong. And so that's why the prosecutor is supposed to pr- uh, present evidence of a crime to the grand jury. And then the grand jury is the ones who voted to decide, yes, this case can go forward. And that's just up to this point. Now we have the charge. From here forward, the judge will be weighing in on is there, you know, not is uh, is Trump guilty, but is there enough evidence to proceed with this case? And if what the judge sees is this is just the political prosecution, then the, the judge has weapons to uh, defuse the, the prosecution as well. With that in mind, it still does beg the question whether or not this sets a precedent for local prosecutors to go after presidents in the future. Does it set a precedent for that? So if people perceive this as a political prosecution that is um, uh, like a Democratic uh, district attorney goes after Republican uh, political candidates, uh, if that's how this is perceived, then that, like I said, that would be very unusual and it would be uh, violating prosecutorial norms. And one way you kind of change norms is people start violating them a lot. And so if that's, uh, if it's perceived to be a political prosecution, I think that will do some damage to the norm. But if there's enough uh, damage and then some other uh, district attorneys start doing that, uh, that'd be problematic. And and one thing I I just wanna say is, you know, what I'm talking about is the standard of prosecutor behavior, but there's thousands of prosecutors across the country. And so I think that's one thing that people worry about is even if most prosecutors are uh, kind of following the rules, um, there's always outliers. And, and uh, we do have to worry about the outliers because the prosecutor is a very powerful actor and can um, be very disruptive if they're doing things for the wrong reasons. Trump is still running for president. How do you expect his run to continue forward with this happening in the background? Legally, I think it's important to see that it, it doesn't look like this case, at, at this point at least, will prevent him from doing campaign events and, and you know, traveling across the country and continuing on with uh, what he would normally be doing, raising money and all the things. It, it, it certainly could have been, uh, like you could have a criminal case that 
put so many limits on the defendant that it would prevent them. So say like not allow them to travel out of state, not allow them to like use the internet or things like that. And so it, that so far, at least there haven't been any signs that the judge is putting that kind of those kind of restrictions on Donald Trump. And one thing to look for is um, if like that could change. So what happens often with cases is that you start out with very few restrictions, but if things start to change, like threats to uh, people involved, threats to the judge, disruptive behavior um, that impacts the case, the judges sometimes do start to put restrictions on uh, defendants and and that might start to influence, or uh, say like that might uh, limit his ability to campaign. But right now, it doesn't seem like there's anything about this case besides occasional appearances that will interfere with his uh, campaign activities. So you mentioned that if there, you know, if disruptive things happen, are you referring specifically to if if Donald Trump says things that are disruptive potentially, or if anyone does? The judge has a lot of power over the actors in the case. So the judge could say to the district attorney, "You and people in your office cannot say anything about this case." And the and then the judge also has power over the defendant because the judge could say, "Defendant, you and your attorneys can't." Say about this case. And the reason the judge has that power is because the judge can can follow up with restraints in the case. So can say, because you violated my rule about social media posts, you're now not allowed to use the internet or something like that, right? Uh, because it's, it's in this case. What the judge can't do is put limits like that on other people. Can you give us some perspective on the timeline for this kind of case? And if it is a possibility that Trump... Uh, that a verdict is met in this case within the time of his campaign or before the next presidential election, if he's found guilty, you know, how will that affect his ability to either run or become president? Yeah, that's a good question. Also, um, so my initial impression of how this case will play out is that it will be very slow and there will be a lot of cha legal challenges and those will have to be resolved before the trial. And so my sense is it's going to be a very long time horizon for this case, a slow developing case. Uh, and so uh, it might not be resolved right in, in any kind of timely manner. Uh, but if it is, like you said, that's that's the right question. So if there is a conviction, right, that's when we might see some restrictions that do influence uh, his ability to campaign. And the main one, obviously, would be if there's any kind of incarceration. And now it's and I think people are reporting like it, it each count here can carry up to four years uh, in prison. But um, I think it's very unlikely that that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Uh, it's certainly possible that he can be convicted on all the counts or some of the counts and not end up with any incarceration. And so in that case, I think he would still be able to um, continue on with his campaign. What will you be watching for between now and Trump's next court appearance on December 4th? I'd like to see what uh, Donald Trump's attorneys think are his strongest arguments. Um, you know, a lot of the, like times when I look at these cases as someone who was a former prosecutor or is a former prosecutor, I'm very conscious that there's there's a lot more information than people can see from the outside. There is some legal complexity to this case. And one of the curious things about the indictment is it didn't really identify specifically the legal theory the prosecution's using to elevate the misdemeanor offenses here to felony offenses. And I'm, I'm still kind of staying tuned to see how that's going to work exactly because uh, that will result. So there's, there's going to be some factual issues about can they prove Donald Trump's personal involvement in the false business records and his intent when he, if he was involved. And then second, I think there's going to be legal complexity about this theory of the case. And all those things are going to have to go the prosecution's way if there's going to be a conviction. We will certainly be watching alongside you. Jeffrey Bellin with William & Mary Law School, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nicole Ellis.